subject of this uh, fourth lecture is virtue, and it's subdivided into four parts. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about man's function and excellence, or virtue. Uh, secondly, about the array of virtues. And third, the distinction between the intellectual and the moral virtues. And finally, on the hierarchy of virtues, how the various virtues are related to one another, ordered uh, among themselves. <coughs> The question, what is the good for man, uh, is uh, one that we've seen discussed already in terms of man's ultimate end uh, and uh, the fact that uh, it uh, relates to uh, his nature and what would be uh, fulfilling of it. I want now to uh, say a few words about Aristotle's uh, approach uh, to this uh, issue. I indicated when we were looking at the uh, first uh, article of the first question of the first part of the second part of the Summa, uh, that when Thomas uh, talks about human actions and when he talks about uh, the fact that the good and an ultimate good, ultimate end, uh, is uh, just built into the picture when we're talking about uh, uh, human actions, that this is not the way uh, in which Aristotle uh, came up with the notion of an ultimate end. Uh, what, what was Aristotle's uh, way? Uh, Aristotle uh, said that uh, what we have to do is uh, to ask what man's function is, what man's role is. And what he had in mind was this. If you, for example, would say of somebody that they're a good golfer, uh, you would first of all have to know what golfing is, what the function is, what the activity is, and that would have built into it the criteria of doing it well or badly. And insofar as one fulfilled that activity, uh, fulfilled that role, performed that activity well or badly, you would say that uh, they had the excellence of that uh, activity. It's arete, or uh, as that Greek term is translated, virtue. So uh, all we need do on this basis, if we want to know, that is, if we want to know if someone's a good golfer, we have to know, well, what's golfing? If we want to know whether somebody is a good bank teller, we have to know, well, what's, what, what's that function? What's that role? Uh, once we know that, we'll be able to tell whether uh, you're doing it well or badly. And so it would be with an automobile, with a camera, with someone who is directing a program, and so forth. Once we uh, know what the function is, then we're able to appraise whether it's uh, being done uh, well well or uh, badly. Now, before continuing with this, uh, it's, it's important, it's probably inevitable, that uh, we allude to what has seemed to be an enormous roadblock uh, to this uh, uh, kind of procedure, and indeed to the procedure that uh, we attributed to Thomas Aquinas uh, in our previous lecture. And this goes back to a question uh, that David Hume uh, raised, and he raised it as a question, that it was a kind of skeptical obstacle that he was throwing across the path of moral philosophy. And it goes something like this. Uh, Hume says, I hear people talking a lot in this fashion. They'll say, well, uh, such and such is the case, and so and so is the case. Therefore, you ought to do something or other. Uh, and uh, Hume says, isn't it odd that we're able to deduce or derive a ought from an is? Now, this, uh, this uh, little question of Hume's uh, has fascinated philosophers ever since. Uh, and it took on new life in our own century when in 1903, G.E. Moore published a little book called Principia Ethica. Uh, and in it, uh, Moore described the uh, transition or the effort to make a transition from the way things are to the way they ought to be or from the way things are to the way we ought to be. Uh, he called that the naturalistic fallacy. He gave it a fancy name like that. And of course, nobody wants to be guilty of a fallacy. Once, uh, once that had been uh, established uh, to uh, Moore's satisfaction, and it, as I say, it had a great influence, what it came down to was this. You can know to a fairly well all about what a human being is, what a human being does, and that doesn't take you one inch closer to knowing what a human being ought to do. You'll never know whether someone, uh, some human being, is, is acting well or badly uh, in terms of knowing uh, what, uh, what their nature is, uh, for example. Example, it's possible. Uh, it's possible to uh, to tell the story of Anglo-American philosophy through the century in terms of a variety of reactions uh, to this uh, uh, to this uh, reintroduction, uh, so to say, of Hume's uh, guillotine, as uh, as it's been called, uh, into uh, 20th century moral philosophy by by G. E. Moore. 
uh, Moore himself uh, became uh, uh, an intuitionist. That is, he thought there were objective good, moral goods and evils, but he thought you just saw them, and they had nothing to do with the way things are. They're not something you could arrive at knowledge of from a greater uh, and more profound knowledge of yourself or human beings or the things around us. It was just you saw them uh, in the way in which you see yellow. It's just there's no antecedent to it. You just have this kind of moral intuition or this moral sense. And either you have it or you don't, of course. Now, one of the difficulties with uh, that view is that uh, it doesn't help us at all to understand why it is that we argue about moral judgment. Uh, I say something's good, you say it's, it's bad. Uh, and we tend to think that there are certain things that count on, on, uh, on behalf of the one answer or the other, so that the argument goes on in, in those terms. If, if Hume is right, uh, or if Hume, well, if Hume is right, yeah, but if Moore is right, uh, none of this makes any sense whatsoever, because none of those premises would really be relevant to the conclusion uh, as to the goodness or badness uh, of, a, of a particular uh, action. Very strange view, we might, you might think. And when people began to want to take more seriously into account the fact that we do argue on behalf of certain uh, value judgments, as uh, uh, they tend to be called, uh, when they wanted to uh, analyze a moral argument, uh, they tended to kind of put into the background uh, this uh, assumption of, uh, of uh, G.E. Moore that uh, no factual premises would ever be sufficient for uh, arriving at a, uh, at a value judgment. So it was assumed in terms of the moral reasoning that you have to have already in the premises a, um, uh, a uh, evaluative proposition along with a descriptive one, and then you would be able from a from a combination of a value judgment and a description, you would be able to derive some further value judgment. But uh, that had to be uh, built into it. Now, what, uh, what happened, uh, just to uh, continue this sketch of the 20th century moral philosophy, among the uh, philosophical theories that was advanced was that, of course, we have these arguments, and we might disagree about the facts of the situation in which we act, but when you come right down to the values, to the goods and the, and the evils uh, that we, are, uh, we assert, there, there, is simply, there is simply nothing in the objective uh, situation that we're talking about which, um, uh, which they name. Huh? So the question is, what, what does good mean? Then. If I if I see uh, someone uh, applying a Louisville slugger to the head of a little old lady, and I say that's bad, and you say no, that's that's okay, nice backswing, and so forth. Uh, here we're disagreeing about uh, about what's uh, going and not what's happening. We both would describe the situation, let's say, in identical ways, but I I disapprove of it, and you approve of it. Uh, what, uh, what emerged from this was, was a view, it was one view among others at first, that to say of something that it's good or bad is to express your emotions, your feelings, your subjective attitude towards it, and not to name anything further in the objective situation uh, that you're talking about. Emotivism, uh, as this uh, was called. And as uh, Alistair McIntyre has, uh, has suggested, we are all emotivists now. Uh, McIntyre sees our situation as one of universal emotivism, uh, so that uh, people are very likely to say when they uh, disagree with someone else morally, or when somebody makes a moral judgment they don't like, that it's an expression of the of the feelings or the subjectivity uh, of that other person, and it doesn't have any objective claim on them. Now, the trouble with that is uh, that uh, it makes it impossible not only to have moral agreement, but to have moral disagreement. Because then what a moral judgment is like is uh, something like my saying, uh, or a moral disagreement, a parent one would be, I say, I have lower back pain, and you say, I don't. Uh, and uh, the, the, obviously, these are two perfectly compatible uh, uh, claims. You're, you're talking about your lack of pain, and I'm talking about my uh, uh, pain, so that we can both say that, and, and they don't collide. If a moral judgment, uh, if emotivism was true, moral judgments would be of that kind. When I say of a certain kind of action or single action that it is good, I'm just expressing my feeling. And if you say it's bad, you're just expressing your feeling. So as in the pain example, we're not really disagreeing with one another. So